it. Um, uh, I'm doing this talk more because I am a board member of the Open Source Initiative. Um, I am also a software developer. Um, and McCoy is here co-presenting with me um, because McCoy is actually a lawyer um, and has done um, intellectual property law around open source for a long time. Yeah. Um, I'm local. Yep. I'm the lo we're both local. So. Yeah. And, and you'll see both of us on license review, um, where I think both of us have been, been posting for like 20 years. So the um, my talk today is about why uh, free and open source software must be discrimination free. Um, I, as required by the conference, let me give a quick uh, free and open source software disclaimer, which is we will be talking about software that is not open source. That is kind of the point of this talk. Um, so we're going to mention that. Um, and if uh, you want to copy the slides here, and the last slide has all the copyright info for the slides themselves. Um, so uh, we'll go on. Um, and so with that, Talk a little bit about discrimination, uh, which is in there, right? Uh, you pop over to merriamwebster.com. We get two different definitions of discrimination. Um, one is to exercise, one is a prejudice or prejudicial outlook, action, or treatment, right? It's a negative definition of discrimination, right? Is exercising prejudice. Um, and our second definition here, right? is the quality or of finally distinguishing, right? Exercising your judgment. Um, these are two pretty contrasting definitions. And they're kind of important for this talk because one of the things you run into is people who are doing the first thing almost always claim they are doing the second thing. So now, when we say that free and open source software must be discrimination free, um, we're talking primarily, like I'm coming from the OSI, I'm talking about the open source definition, which has 10 clauses, right? And two of these clauses have to do with discrimination. And we're talking discrimination in the first sense, right? Um, the um, no, first is number five, which is no discrimination against persons or groups, right? That if you want your software to be open source, it cannot say that the software is off limits to certain people or certain groups. You want to make a comment about this one? Or? No, no, okay. Um, the second one is number six, which says no discrimination against fields of endeavor, right? And fields of endeavor is a fancy way of saying, oh, I'm stepping, wow, that cable is super sensitive. Um, that um, I, that, Fields of Endeavor is a fancy way of saying that you can't say that the software cannot be used for a specific purpose. Um, and uh, in this case, it actually is for the Some people get to this. Some people have a lot of trouble with this. They're like, hey, wait a minute here. This is my software, right? Um, why can't I? Hey, maybe I don't want my software to be used for making war, right? Or maybe I don't want, to want it to be used in crimes, right? Or maybe. I don't want it to be used, you know, I'm pro-Ukraine, I don't want it to be used in Russia, right? Or um, I don't want those folks at AWS using it because they compete with my business. Um, there are a lot of restrictions that people would like to make um, on their otherwise open source software. But there are problems with making those restrictions. Many people have actually tried, right, to make restrictions, to, to basically come up with licenses that have a lot of these restrictions. Going back to before open source was even really coined as a term, um, the, um, uh, one of them here, uh, a rather well-known one, is the peaceful open source license. 
um, which is from the late 90s, I think. It says the software may not be used to cause deliberate harm to any individual either directly or indirectly in any form. Um, otherwise, it was a um, it was a uh, Berkeley license, right? Or MIT? Uh, one of the two. That's a Berkeley. Okay, yeah. Um, I you know very similarly the Canadian Mind license um, had a specific prohibition against military. Um, by the way, this software that's under the Canadian Mind license is still out there. It just no longer says that it's open source. Um, the um, I, the, and then, of course, we have a lot more recent, particularly a lot more recent software with fields of use restrictions, right? The, um, I, for example, the Redis uh, license, their custom license that says that um, you cannot make the software available to third parties as a service um, I, if you're using their license. Um, the Llama 3 license has a long list of prohibitions attached to it. You may not notice this if you just look at the license and you don't follow the links to the attached documentation. But I would say you do is you say you cannot use it. Um, first of all, you can't use any of the code from the Llama license in another LLM, right? So if you have your own LLM, you can't borrow any code from, the, uh, from, the, from Llama 3. Um, and you also cannot allow it to be used in a whole list of things, right? They have committing a crime, and they have, you know, for war, and they have for torture, and they have a whole page-long list of things that Llama 3 is not allowed to be used in other ways. So this is obviously a popular idea, right? Both field of use restrictions and restricting people. Field of use restrictions more more popular. So, uh, and it's so popular, in fact, that there's now a whole sort of separate subdivision for it. Um, uh, the ethical licensing. Um, I, is, is often what it's called. Um, the sort of paragon of which is the Hippocratic license, which is actually not a single license, but a license construction kit created by Cornelia Funk uh, rather exhaustively, right? If you are going to do this kind of licensing, despite it, you know, not being free and open source, um, then this is where I would start because she certainly thought a lot more of it out than other people have. Um, the, um, and you can see that you can pick a very large number of options for things that you are going to prohibit in your license. So if this is such a popular idea, if so many people want to do it, why can't we? Right? Why is this not something that we can just go ahead and do and still call it open source? Well. One major thing, because I want to actually step away from the open source definition right now and step to the other definition that we use for qualifying open source software, which is the four freedoms. Um, so uh, the open source definition was uh, drafted primarily by Bruce Perrins for the Debian project. Shortly thereafter, Richard Stallman released the four freedoms um, as a different um, but compatible test for whether or not something was free software. And you notice that he, he numbered it from zero um, in programmer sense. And he noticed that freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. Right? That is freedom zero for free software. And if you look at, um, and that's because, you know, again, going back to why did we create free software in the first place? Why did Stallman do his initiative? Why did other people join free software? Is It's about protecting user freedom. Um, and all everything else, right, you could say is details, right? What does protect user freedom? What doesn't protect user freedom? Right? Both the open source, the four freedoms, the um, OSDR, is this protecting user freedom? And by user freedom, I don't mean somebody else. I mean you. Because for every one of us, even if we are uh, free software authors, even if we work full time as programmers, we use a lot more software than we write. Right? I mean, like, I don't know how many thousand programs are on my laptop right now, um, just so that I can draft a three line PR um, uh, in, in order to submit it. And 
the, um, and for that matter, even when you are writing that software, right, is any new software package that you release is going to be dependent unless, you know, unless you're one of those people who writes stuff on assembly for custom microprocessors. Just about anything else that you're doing is going to be dependent on an enormous body of previously written free software that you will incorporate, right? So even as a software developer, you are primarily a user. You are a user before you're a software developer. So when we're talking about user freedom, we're talking about your freedom. Um, a lot of where people get into restrictions on use and that sort of thing is they're thinking of themselves as the originator of the software and everyone else is a user, and they forget that they are also a user. So the, um, they're also, in addition to um, talking about the basic compromise of user freedom, which is a violation of the core freedoms and that sort of thing, um, and we'll do some of the problems, there are also some problems with straying into restrictions on usage as opposed to restrictions on copying and modification. So in addition, so we've got the fundamental problem with having licenses that discriminate, right? Is that in order to discriminate, you have to restrict use, right? And that violates freedom zero. But if you say, okay, well, freedom zero is an ideal. Um, that's, you know, nice, but I don't really care about that. Let's talk about some other complications that allowing restrictions on allowing discriminatory licenses create. So one of the problems we run into is these discriminatory terms, licenses, once they're attached to a piece of software that people use and download and copy and redistribute on their own, last for a really long time. I mean, like one project that McCoy and I are currently working on for the OSI is going through a lot of the older licenses seeing whether or not they're used, whether or not they're duplicates, whether or not we want to flag them, that people really probably shouldn't be using this license anymore um, because there are better licenses that have the same terms, et cetera, right? And it's amazing how long some of these licenses stick around, right? In the meantime, things like political circumstances change. So in the mid, in early 90s, so this is, I think it was 1990, um, I, and this is from a lecture by Bruce Perrins, um, so I don't have the exact dates. Um, I, UC Berkeley students released a version of the Berkeley license on some software that specifically had a use restriction that said, and this was during the height of a lot of anti-apartheid protests, um, that said uh, the software may not be used by the police or security forces of South Africa. Well, Within five years, who those police and security forces were had changed pretty radically. But if somebody hadn't talked them out of keeping that license, which they did, so it didn't end up being permanently attached to that software, it would still be the case that even though the police of South Africa are now a racially mixed group working for a democratic government, they still would not be allowed to use the software. 
because the term hadn't changed. So, you know, the fact that one of the things you have to think about when adding, you know, terms to software is that, you know, hard to predict the future. Um, second thing is about enforcement. And I wish I were entirely joking with this, but I have in fact seen that in, in a, a, um, an open source license attempt. Um, shall not use the software to commit murder. So the first question with that is, you know, if somebody's going to commit murder, do they really care what your software license says? Um, the, um, I mean, there's also ones where I've just basically said you will obey the law. And that also raises a whole bunch of questions. The law of where? Right? Whose law exactly? Um, because one of the things you have to think about is the fact that open source, free and open source software is worldwide. Right? And, and so things like a U.S. export restriction, for example, is pretty meaningless if uh, you're from uh, Thailand. Um, Well, and, and from time to time, certain governments have banned open source software itself. Um, and so a you will obey the law restriction means that, oh, hey, by the way, not only is your government turned against you, but we're going to revoke your license. Right. But, but the idea is that we don't want to be deciding that in a software license. The, um, so... And then one of the other things I just touched on earlier is the definitions of a lot of terms that people would like to stick in a discriminatory license are not very clear. They don't have accepted definitions that apply across different court systems, um, across different types of cases. Um, Non-commercial is probably the best defined of those, and, and even that has a lot of caveats, right? Like one of the examples I give is um, one of my wife has a publishing consulting company. One of the things she does is rights research. And so she was doing rights research for something, and they wanted to use some stuff that was uh, um, uh, Creative Commons non-commercial, right? And, and they were like, well, it's fine. We're a nonprofit university. We can use that, right? Well, yeah, but this is for a book that you're charging money for. Well, all of a sudden, that's kind of unclear. Right, um, and it might even come down to: Are they actually making a margin on that book or not, or is it completely just paying expenses? Right, and so with a lot of these, um, yeah, 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 But it's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. And 
and and of course other terms have much uh, much more vagueness. Like one of the things that's come in through a lot of the recent licenses, what exactly is a web service? Right? That is not at all defined in law. Um, the um, I remember that, I don't know how many hearings during the Oracle uh, Google case were around what is an API at all, right? Just trying to define it. Um, the um, And obviously like things, you look at things like the piece OSL harm. Well now there's a term that everyone has their own individual opinion on. Um, so, and the problem with vague terminology, right, is vague terminology eventually lands you in court, which is expensive. Um, and there's a second problem with vague terminology in terms of, of use. The, um, oh, sorry, that's, <laughs> I meant to have that up while you were talking. Um, the, um, yeah, oh, right, and you know, the, the unilateral thing. The um, yeah. Um, so now one of the other big big issues that we have to talk about in terms of uh, discriminatory licenses, right, is proliferation. And we've already been through this with non-discriminatory licenses, right? Because up until about two thousand four, right, um, folks in the OSI, folks elsewhere were like, "Hey, open source is great. You should write your own license." And everybody did that, right? And if you look at the OSI list of licenses, you'll find probably somewhere in there 20 to 30 licenses whose only distinguishing characteristic is that they have a different company name on it. Um, you know, plus two sentences are changed from another license. And um, that was a very popular thing to do until we suddenly had, you know, 80 or 90 different licenses. And we're looking at it and we're saying, hey, this is actually kind of a problem, right? This is kind of a problem because there are so many licenses that people are not familiar with the licenses that are out there. They don't know if they're really open source or not. They don't know what terms apply to them. It becomes a barrier to people wanting to adopt the software. Um, the, um, at which point we started a non-proliferation initiative and started really trying to encourage people in order to use the same popular, well-known licenses in order to avoid the proliferation problem. Well, the minute that you add discriminatory terms to a license, you have suddenly added multiple dimensions to ways in which you can proliferate, right? Because there are an infinite number of terms that, you know, an infinite number of concepts that you might want to discriminate on. Um, like, let's talk about, for example, if you're developing a piece of software, very simplified, you know, version of software. Obviously, any dependency tree for a real piece of software would be much, much larger than this, right? But like, you're developing the software, you're putting in a and you're distributing an OS and you're dependent on, say, three libraries that come with that OS. 
and it's written in you know Rust, and you've got two key Rust libraries that you have in there, and you are using a um, uh, you're using a compiler so you can actually rebuild it as WebAssembly, right? And so you've got all of this as this sort of dependency tree. Now, imagine that each one of these has a different discriminatory license, right? So out of your libraries, you have one that isn't allowed to be used in the military, and one that requires everyone who uses it to be vaccinated, and another one that's only allowed to be used for right-handers, and one that says you may not use this for AI because they hate AI, and another one was written by an Armenian, and so they say nobody Turkish is allowed to use the software. Um, oh, and the, um, the compiler requires everybody who uses it to be a supporter of the Software Freedom Conservancy. Well, so now the only people who can use this software, right, are right-handed people who don't work in the military, are vaccinated, aren't Turkish, are not using it for AI, and support the Software Freedom Conservancy. You've suddenly restricted your group of users, your group of potential users, to this sort of small group of people. But it can get worse than that, right? Because these terms can conflict, right? Imagine that you have one library you want to use that says this can only be used, but you're only allowed to use it in AI projects, right? We're only opening it up for that purpose. And you're not allowed to use it for any other kind of software. And in the meantime, you have another library you want to use that says you cannot use it in, in AI projects. And as you have this sort of cloud of different discriminatory criteria, that sort of conflict becomes eventually inevitable. Sure. So one of the questions is one of enforcement, which actually is kind of a question, right? Because one of the nice things about free and open source software terms applying to people who distribute and modify software, right, is that it is easier to notice somebody who is distributing than it is to notice somebody who is merely using your software, right? I work actually in the Red Hat open source program office. One thing people ask me all the time is for good ways to estimate the number of users they have. And that's really hard, right? Unless your software has some kind of phone home criteria in it, which users generally hate and will disable. Um, and if it's open source, they're allowed to disable it, right? Um, the, um, it's really, really hard to figure out even how many users you have, let alone if any of those users are using the software for a prohibited purpose. So you mainly actually are screening out the well-behaved users who have corporate lawyers and consult them, right? You're not screening out the users who don't care, the users who don't pay attention to the license terms, you know, anything else. Yeah, and, and in terms of your question about which would take precedence, the answer is none of them would. All the terms for every license apply um, regardless of what else you combine it with. And, and that is where the problem is, right? Like in this particular case, I couldn't build this software. Right? I, I need to remove one of these two libraries from the software before I can proceed. Um, 
I could build it. I'd be in violation of the license terms. Right, yes. So yeah, but I mean, it actually is time for questions because we're talking about this. So basically, um, basically, the conclusion is, right, is that discrimination clauses are usage restrictions, right, as a rule. Yeah, and usage restrictions are incompatible with user freedom, and they also create major legal and practical complications for both you as a user um, and you as a software author. And this is the reason why discrimination clauses are incompatible with free and open source software. Well, contribution guidelines are, it, it doesn't, these operate on different levels. I mean, the one place where licenses impact contribution guidelines is most of the time contribution guidelines are saying, if you are contributing to this project, you are contributing under this license, right? Um, No, but you see, that, that's very different, right? Because there's, that's two very different things, right? Because what those, those projects are saying, and I work on one of them, which is Kubernetes, right? What those projects are saying is, you may not use AI to generate code or documentation that you're going to contribute to our project. Um, you know, they have a variety of reasons to do this. Um, uh, in the case of Kubernetes, we're doing it for two reasons. Number one is, the courts are still undecided on the copyright situation of, of LLM output. Um, there's still a lot of cases in process with that, and we don't want to accept something and then find out that it was illegal to accept that. Um, and the second reason is um, when LLMs are generating code, they are great at generating code that looks correct but contains a lot of subtle bugs. <coughs> and we don't want to be increasing our bug count. Absolutely. I don't think that's the wording we adopted for the final version of the CAL. <laughs> 
Yeah. Which is a big one. And I remember that we really restricted exactly what kinds of data it could apply to in order to make it a disclosure obligation rather than a usage restriction. Because the original drafts were quite a, quite a lot broader. I mean, mostly what I'm upset about is the cow is that it ended up not really being useful to people. Nobody's adopted it that I know of. Yeah, nobody's adopted it that I know of. So, um, the um, yeah, yeah. What we have, I mean, and this and this is why it's important to distinguish between a field of use restriction and a disclosure requirement, um, and, and and why that is sort of the key argument about this, right? Because, because I mean, copyleft specifically, the idea is that what copyleft is, you have a disclosure requirement, right? You're not trying to say, hey, people who work for the military can't use it; they can use it all they want. They just have to share their source code. Um, the um, and the, and if you think about it, for open source software, the one field of use that, the one field of endeavor we must discriminate against is proprietary software. Um, uh, because otherwise you are limited to only, um, you're basically limited to MIT and BSD if, if, if that, is, if that is, is not the one thing that is off limits. Yeah, the um, we can probably make your argument. I mean, uh, so BSD is Yeah. Right, yeah. But then there's, there's, well, and there's also the, the whole, I mean, like every time when New Life comes up, it's going to be hard to say, hey, is this a discrimination clause or a disclosure requirement, right? Well, that's, I mean, we've got this open source AI, you know, definition discussion going on right now, this whole process with town halls and stuff, where we're actually, people are discussing a lot of that stuff. We're to, yeah, Stevan is actually talking about that tomorrow. So, 
And there's another group who's talking about that tomorrow, separate from what the OSI is doing. Um, the, um, uh, I mean, actually, the argument that we're currently having is going the other way, which is whether or not, in general, for it to be open source, we should require the disclosure of training data. But certainly, I would say at the stage that we're at, if somebody had a license, a specific, a specific license they were using with their open source model code, their their AI model code, that said that hey, any training data used as model with has to be disclosed, I don't think we would rule that out. I think I think that would, I mean, I can't, I can't personally give it the stamp of approval, but I would probably argue in favor of that being open source. Yeah, yeah, but you can't because that actually violates another term of the OSD. Um, hmm? Well, whether or not that's a practical thing to do depends on what the original license is. Right? Some licenses, MID, BSD, um, Apache to some extent, um, permit you to bundle additional software that's under a different license. And people do that all the time. Um, the, um, I mean, as I point out, there's a bunch of BSD license code in Windows. Um, the, um, and that's the big difference between copyleft and non-copyleft, right? Because the, the disclosure requirements of copyleft um, and the interpretation of um, dependencies make it much, much harder to do that kind of bundling. Um, the, um, and, and a lot of this, you know, and one of the things I'll say here is, right, is the open source definition is what we operate on and we judge on and that sort of thing. But um, we also pay a lot of attention to the four freedoms. Um, like, I actually kind of wonder what the OSD would look like today if the four freedoms had come out first. Um, but we pay a lot of attention to the four freedoms, particularly in these sort of vague borderline cases, right? And you're ultimately looking at is, does this actually protect user freedom or not? Um, the um, uh, you know and you know when you're deciding on is it a disclosure requirement or is it a discrimination etc. That's one of your tests is does it protect user freedom? Uh, Stolman actually came up with a couple of additional useful tests like the Desert Island test um, that that you know are things that we discuss and that's why judging a new license is a highly interactive process um, because there are a lot of subtle shadings of things. That we have to argue about, about okay, well, on the one hand, things like with the cow, right? On the one hand, this actually increases the freedom of this one group of users while restricting this other group of users, and what's the net effect, right? 
Yeah. Just and and they they operate on different levels. I mean, because because I mean, actually, is you know, part of the presentation is is the place for that is not in the license. Um, it's it's elsewhere because, for example, you have users who are an active part of your community, but you have users who aren't. Um, and community standards apply to the people who are an active part of your community, um, uh, mostly because licenses are an ineffective way to try to regulate worldwide behavior. Um, the, um, um, and, and so you apply that at a different level. You say, hey, you know, if you're going to be in our forums, right, you have to agree to this code of conduct. Um, you know, we're not going to stop you from downloading the software, um, but, um, but you know, you're off the forum if you can't adhere to this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, particularly right. That was the whole thing about about the open source initiative and stuff was to apply it to corporations. Right. So you don't say, well, so therefore I can do this. It's been successful to the extent that we have fewer new licenses, right? Because, um, and, um, you know, and things like the genericizing of licenses, the idea that it's not a different license just because somebody's name is, it's a different name in the fill in the blank. Um, the, um, yeah, so it, it's been semi successful, right? The problem is that we can't actually remove the old licenses if they are, in fact, if they do in fact comply with the OSD, right? Because that software may still be out there and we don't want somebody to think it's not open source just because we're discouraging people from using the license because it's duplicative, right? Um, that's one of the problems that we're struggling with currently is the license list um, is the license list serves a dual purpose, right? One is it's a menu for software developers to choose from in terms of licensing their own stuff. And we would like to have a much shorter list of licenses for that purpose, but at the same time, End users want to look at it and say, hey, the software I just downloaded, is it actually open source? And for that, we need to list everything. Okay, and I'm being told that I need to clear the room so the next speaker can set up. So we are happy to talk more in the hall. Thanks, everybody.